okay, Deb, don't worry, I believe in you. It's okay, Deb, what? I believe in you, don't worry. I you. you shouldn't believe in me right now. Okay. You're going to be good. You're going to be great. Everything's going to be awesome. And if it isn't, then, you know, yeah. just another day on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. That's right. <laughs> Did you just literally take a photo of yeah. the screen? No, of myself. Okay. Are you sure you're not a Leo? I have no Leo placements. You know it's weird. I know it is weird. Anyway. Good Friday morning here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast, and welcome to episode 106 and 303 of the entire Cross Border Interview series. We are happy to have you back in the sh- uh, happy to have you back on this beautiful Friday morning, or not Friday, beautiful Friday morning, depending. I'm gonna fucking stop that right now. <laughs> But Why I should take a photo of Friday morning. Because actually, it's not that's a, Friday morning. This is oh, a great. Okay. You're a genius. Okay. The, you, you, you I'll know. go with it. Like, yeah, it's Friday morning. Here's my coffee. See. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, are you okay, Chris? Are, are you okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Fuck. Call Ricardo. I need help. Yeah. I'm having an attack. I'm not okay. 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 Good Friday morning here on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. For those who are listening, you know that this has been pre-recorded due to the fact that I am recovering from a surgery that happened on December 2nd. So uh, we are back in studio for our last ever political roundtable of 2021. And we are bringing back in two guests who we had come into the show to talk about the 2021 municipal election. I am pleased and honored once again to have Deborah Draper, uh, the former MLA for Calgary Bow, and current, uh, I'm going to get this wrong, I should have asked her beforehand, but she advisor. Cur- advisor to Alberta Council. And then we have Olga Barcelo, great friend and also former CBE <laughs> school board trustee candidate for Ward 6 and 7. Uh, thank you, Olga and Drever. Uh, Drever. Debra, for being here today. This is gonna be everyone a... calls me Trevor. <laughs> okay. Thank Fine. you for so much for doing this. Yes, of course. Thank you for having us again. I'm so happy to be back here. Yeah, me too. Love Woo! It. <laughs> Big fan of the podcast. Yes. Yeah, even though at the beginning of this episode, when I screwed up the first time, you said, "Why are you saying it's Friday?" Because I pre-record episodes. Way to listen to the last few episodes. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, I'm throwing shade already. Two minutes into this. Um, we are back and we are going to be talking, as usually, as usual, about politics in the last 30 days. But as it's the last episode of 2021, we're going to be talking about politics and what has happened in Canada in the last 12 months. Uh, 2021 has, been, has seen its ups and downs for everyone and politics is no different. So Deborah and Olga have graciously accepted the role of recounting what has happened over the last 12 months and i'm going to start with this very simple question to olga i'm going to i'm going to point blank it how was your 2021 oh you know (laughs) this is this is a safe space to talk about feelings yeah you know a lot of um personal changes happened throughout this year if i'm very honest with you um a lot of just changing up priorities you know i think that's kind of the best way to go about it but you were a candidate uh, i was a candidate for school board trustee uh, yes as i mentioned you were unsuccessful and if you watched our election can uh, election special you know that yeah um how's life been post uh campaign it's been good you know i'm kind of just organizing myself i'll be starting my second degree in the fall Woo. and um so yeah love that for me yeah. we love that we love education here exactly. um, but um otherwise things have been good you know a lot of different uh, personal changes in my life for the best but i have really great people around me who've been supporting me throughout this interesting time and i can't complain awesome deborah how about yourself how has your 2021 been uh i would somewhat mundane you know it's the same old same old I did start a new position with Alberta Council back in August um so that's really the biggest thing that's happened to me this year um but yeah no it's just been the same old same old I've been going to the dog park lots with my two dogs uh hanging out with my animals just living life trying to stay healthy um the one good thing about 2021 though is i get to actually see my friends and family now that we're all vaccinated so yeah um 
that's a positive because 2020 was very uh, boring. <laughs> not gonna lie, and it was hard. It was a very hard year for everyone. So, um, yeah, here's the 2022. <laughs> And for anyone who's listening to this and watching this, I should uh, be I should be upfront about this. Uh, we yes, we are still in a pandemic, and we're going to be talking about COVID nineteen and the pandemic that we've been going through over the last. Uh, for those who are also watching, you might see a dog's head pop up from time <laughs> to time. That is because Olga and Deborah have both said that they are comfortable with our fourth guest, who is unofficially might make some whines and moans through this. We're all going to be down here during the recording, but I should also mention going back to my original statement that. Um, we are all double vaccinated. Uh, we are a place of business, our household. We are an independent business. And I have scanned the QR codes for everyone when they walk through the door. So that way I know, and that way the government knows that we are doing this above board. We are socially distanced, but we are doing this above board. So please, please, please just make sure you are doing everything above board right now, because I know it is challenging out there and we are seeing the end of the the pandemic but we still got a long way to go yeah so let's talk about the pandemic because that's always a great place to start when we're talking about 2021 uh, the pandemic that was supposed to end with vaccination seems to have gone on on and on and on it first started yeah. with the uh vaccination rollout earlier this year of yes. end of last year earlier this year then we had the rise of the Delta variant, yep. first found in the United Kingdom. Mm -hmm. And now just recently, as literally as of recording this, we have four confirmed cases of the new, new variant. And I'm going to get this one wrong here, but the Omicron variant, or as I like to call it, the Megatron variant, because I don't know if, how to pronounce it properly. Yeah. That was first found in South Africa. So... All right, let's start with Deborah on this one. COVID-19, 2021, it was supposed to be the year that it ended, but it seems to be going on. Mm -hmm. What what have you seen over the last year that kind of hopefully gives you some reassurance that people are still taking this serious? Um, I mean, we currently have a government that's not taking this seriously, and so that for me is the big downer, but I having said that i believe that the majority of albertans are taking this seriously um that you know we want to get back to work we want to be with our loved ones um you know and that's why a lot of people have been double vaccinated um people are wearing their masks when i go out in public i see that um and you know i think the majority of albertans want to um work together so that we can you know keep each other safe uh, but like I said, you know, it doesn't help that we have a premier that, you know, isn't, is going the opposite direction. Uh, yeah. And we'll talk about that, uh, premier here shortly, but I'm assuming when you're talking about a government, you're talking about the Alberta government yeah, because yeah. we, while we can have some disagreements about how Justin Trudeau has handled this and how Mayor Nenshi and Mayor Gondek have handled this locally here in Calgary, uh, I'm assuming you're more mention uh, more thinking about uh, yeah. Jason Kenney. Sorry, um, my my brain's wired to provincial government only, <laughs> so when I refer to the government, it's provincial. Um, but yes, that's who I was referring to. Olga, we'll throw it over to you. When I ask the question, we we have seen the highs and lows of this. We have seen people become more loosey goosey, if I could say the better word, because I was out literally at Safeway, I think a week and a half ago, two weeks ago, as of recording, but three, as of airing this about a month ago, where people were still walking into the grocery store with no masks on. Mm. People were, have, have, have people gotten to the point where they are taking it serious, but they're looking for the end of the tunnel. They're looking for that moment when people can, they can say to themselves, okay, this is as normal as we are going to get in the future. Olga? I have a lot of thoughts. Ooh, that's great for an audio podcast. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, um, but anyway, uh, I mean, I myself, I mean, like, and everyone in my life, well, not everyone, but the large majority of people in my life are immunocompromised. I have a heart condition, and it has been something that when I think about this pandemic and the treatments and therapies that are offered, um, I'm in a bunch of these groups on, on social media where we're talking to people with the same heart condition that I have. And it's kind of terrifying because some of the, the therapies and treatments you can't have. So, I mean, I always had my mask on. I was always an advocate for keeping masks on. I was, um, I qualified because of 
the um, immunocompromised status that I have, that I did get my vaccine a little bit earlier, not much earlier than everyone else, but the tiniest bit earlier, but you know, I just work because I still see it, you know, I was at, I was at Costco the other day and there's still people who just, they're not getting the message really, they're just kind of like, you know, I'm just going to do whatever I want and it's like, mm-hmm. no, this is, this is bigger than you, but yeah. I don't know. Freedom I'll, fighters. Yes. And you know, I mean, I was doing some holiday shopping just to get that out of the way. And I, I've been listening to this, like, um, one person who's very big into the anti COVID, anti restrictions, that they're going to be scheduling these protests in the malls. And now I know people like, uh, are preparing for that right now. So I mean, oh, wow. which malls all over Canada. Okay. So, this is fun. <laughs> Yay! Yeah. Yay! It brings up a yeah. bigger point to... I had a, I had a guest on last week. Uh, for those who have listened, please tune in to uh, uh, Trouble in Mouseland, our episode that aired last Wednesday, where we talked with someone, and I asked the question, I'm going to ask this to either one of you, whoever wants to take this question. The general public has a short-term memory. We seem to forget a lot, and we seem to want to move on to the next thing. With social media, it's the 15-second news story. If it's not in your mind in 15 seconds, you move on. The reason I say that is because in this interview that I did, uh, we talked about the 215 kids that were found on Mm -hmm. First Nation reserves at residential schools in unmarked graves. There was 215 in Kamloops back, back in May. We, we now, as of recording this, are over 7,150 kids found in unmarked graves across... And I'm going to get a fact check here, I'm assuming, because Olga is typing away, so I'm assuming she's going to pull up the exact number here. But I remember back in January, when COVID-19, the reports of there's 18 new hospitalizations... There's 14 new deaths. There's one new, uh, the, there's like 120 confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Alberta. You flash forward to December, I don't hear that that often anymore. People don't seem to care about the numbers as much as they did in January. Am I wrong in that or am I just getting my news from the wrong people? <laughs> I don't know. I mean... With social media and the news, it's kind of an echo chamber. Everyone kind of, they yeah. they get what they get because you're around people who have similar views or... I, I mean, that's how it is, I think, for most people. But I do keep seeing things about the numbers, and I think you were correct. I Maybe we're wrong. That's well, okay. Well, even, even during but, the September when the mm-hmm. uh, the fourth wave started, we, we saw there's 24 deaths, there's 18 deaths, yeah. there's 19 deaths. Can, can anyone in this room right now... Tell me, how, tell me how many people were confirmed dead today. I did watch the update because they were talking about some stuff. It's not, it's not as many, I think. But that's the um, thing, right? Like, is it, is, are, do, are we so desensitized to, like, one or two people that, like, we have to have a large number to be actually brought back into the eye, eyes of uh, a idea of if it's actually, uh, like, bad or not? I think people just with, um, in regards with deaths with COVID, it, um, people are becoming desensitized because I see people now hearing about the new variant. They're becoming desensitized to that, like thinking, oh, all it's Delta all over again. Um, and I think people are just tired. I mean, I'm personally not, I'm taking this very seriously. I think this is a really big problem as someone with a uh, heart condition and family who have um, a bunch of different health problems. Like I, we're all vaccinated, but that doesn't mean you're still not going to get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It just means maybe you won't get it as bad and you won't be hospitalized, but still it, it, it happens. Yeah. You know, I don't even, I don't find, I haven't found a, an exact number, but it just says it ranges, uh, from 3,200 to over 6,000. So, um, For what? uh, the residential, the first nations. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yet again, this was on uh, Twitter. So you, take that with a grain of salt of how many I'm saying, but I, I, I believe in the source that I read it from, so yeah. I could be wrong, but here we are. And But it, it is more than 215, and there's okay. still going to be more to be found. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. Back on the COVID train here for two seconds before we do start switching it up to a next topic is I, I got to ask the, the stupid funny question because Olga sort of mentioned, made light of it here a few seconds ago. 
people are taking it serious because they saw what happened to the Delta variant. The Delta mm-hmm. variant brought in the fourth wave. Yep. So I ask both of you, have you stocked up on your toilet paper yet? <laughs> <laughs> joking joke. Please I never don't. did that in the first place, okay? I was the one trying to get some toilet paper. <laughs> I remember when that was happening. I was in Costco with my mom, and people were... We were fighting. They were fighting. Yes. We were actually out of toilet paper in that moment, so we needed some yeah. because we just Didn't needed... Didn't have any. But, and I literally put one thing in the cart, and someone took it out. No way. Yeah. Uh, oh. Anyway, I, memories. I, I, yeah, it memories. makes me ask the question. I wonder if they still have some. <laughs> uh, I actually heard that Costco does have a shortage right now of toilet oh, paper. Good. No, but I wonder. I wonder if those people who hoarded the the, the stockpile of toilet oh, paper back in twenty twenty. Possibility. Yeah, I don't know. But but you know, speaking of the hoarding of um, certain commodities, we're seeing a problem with that because of what's happening in British Columbia with this climate crisis mm-hmm. that we're seeing with everything going on with the supply chain being disrupted completely. Yes. People are stockpiling on their essentials from what I've seen. My family we're kind of like yeah, I think we're okay. We don't need to panic because yeah. There's no need to panic. Yeah, exactly. We need to be calm. <laughs> Looking to get your message out? Looking to get your product heard about? Have an upcoming event in the province of Alberta. For as low as $50 per week, you can now advertise on the Cross Border Interview Podcast. Reach out today by visiting www.crossborderinterviews.ca and click on Advertise Now. If you book your advertisement during the month of December, you will get 50% off. Now, let's get back to the episode. segue and i know we didn't talk about this we didn't put this in our list of things that we want to talk about but yeah. the great thing about my show i can leave it in any way direction i want it to <laughs> leave right. it yeah. so I, I so climate change has become front and center over the last i would say 10 months particularly in bc we had the wildfires early in the summer where we saw record highs with linton uh, bc the hottest Hottest location in northern the northern hemisphere came in yeah. BC. We now see that, and I think if I'm not mistaken, like ninety percent of the town burnt down because of yeah. wildfires in the area. We are now seeing in BC floods take out bridges, take out yeah. critical infrastructures that need we need as a Canadian country to bring goods and services across. But we still, on the other hand, have people saying that climate change isn't real. <laughs> yeah. What, what does it take for someone to actually wake up and say, okay, maybe maybe, maybe it's actually real. It's not a hoax? Yeah. yeah. Oh so, my God, who knew? <laughs> who, who knew a big flood or a massive wildfire taking out a whole town isn't yeah. just random acts of weirdness. So I got to ask, so the question is, does has climate change become the thing now? Because I know in 2019 people tried to make that an election issue and people didn't mm-hmm. care. But in this last municipal, last federal election, we saw more prominent on environmental issues. Mm-hmm. Is environmental issues the cool thing now? Mm-hmm. Um. Well, I'll start it off. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I just think that because people are starting to see the repercussions of climate change. Um, that they're starting to maybe, I don't know, it could be changing their minds on if it's a hoax or not. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that we are in a climate crisis right now. And it's not just yeah. in Canada, it's across the world. If you see what's going on, um, it feels like every week we have a new disaster in a different area. And uh, it's really, I mean, we have so much going on as it is to deal with something like that. I couldn't even imagine. I mean, we're so blessed here. I know we've had our floods here in 2013 and um, we have the heat wave in the summertime. And yeah, we've definitely had our issues in Alberta, but I feel like we've been pretty lucky um, in terms of, you know, we haven't had mass about, or we also had the wildfires in Fort uh, McMurray, um, but we haven't had like, you know, the level of BC right now. Um, And yeah, I think that it, now is the time to open your eyes and see that, yeah, we do need to make changes. And I'm not talking on a micro level. I'm talking on a macro level because it is the big companies that are producing the biggest 
uh, pollution and that's causing all these issues, right? So we need to, our government needs to be holding these companies accountable. Um, and that's why I believe that there should be a carbon tax. I mean, people should be paying for their pollution. Um, but, you know, yeah, it is a hot button, hot topic I, I, in I'm the sorry. politics. I, a former NDP MLA just said the magic word. I know. Carbon triggered. Tax Everyone's instead triggered. Of, <laughs> instead of carbon levy. What, what, oh, uh, no. <laughs> I, I, I feel like the right is about to just attack somebody right now. <laughs> okay. I'm not getting into that debate, okay? But, yes, uh, yeah, we'll so, leave it there. So yeah. we'll jump back unless uh, okay, you have anything to add to that. Then we'll jump back to uh, Alberta politics. Here no, you summed it up perfectly. So let's jump back to well, to, as we're talking about climate change and the hottest summer in uh, history in Canada and around the world. Let's talk about the hottest summer here in Calgary in Alberta when we were open for summer. Calgary Stampede. We had great events throughout the months of August, September, and July. People were enjoying themselves. The stampede went off without a hitch. Numbers were down, though. We saw politicians glad-handing, making their pancake breakfasts. We saw po federal politicians getting ready for a campaign. Um, and municipal. And municipal. Yeah. Olga, was thoughts? this the, was this the wrong thought, thoughts on the open for summer? Because we were all given the same information. Yeah. COVID numbers were down. COVID numbers weren't uh, coming back. People were getting vaccinated, which was good. So we took, did, did the Premier take a gamble on this and say open for summer without being cautious and just throwing open the doors and hoping that people would get back to normal? Or was this the right move with the information that we were given? No, no. <laughs> okay, so this is really fun. But <laughs> I, I, have, I have some thoughts on that because I think... Taking away the mask mandate also is just yeah. a huge problem because I know for myself, I was still masking up, going everywhere, anywhere, yeah. indoors, because it's the right thing to do because you can still transmit the virus. Yeah. It doesn't mean that you're immune, obviously. Yeah. Um, and I mean, I did see people just, like a ton of people just kind of thinking, oh, now that this is happening, I don't have to wear the mask and it's gone. And it's kind of like a false sense of hope. Maybe they're trying to like maybe internalize that, okay, you know, things are going to get better. I think everyone wants things to get better, but you have to do it in a way that's effective, in a way that is safe. And taking away mask mandates, bad move. I'm glad we have the mask mandate back in now because, you know, I, I don't know when we can even, like, obviously, like, eventually, depending on vaccination levels, because at least now five-year-olds um, five to 11-year-olds can get vaccinated because yeah. I know that was a really big thing over the summer, right? Mm -hmm. Kids can still transmit it. So anyway, I have a whole bunch of thoughts. I'm kind of going all over the place. No, but you're Deborah. right. No, you're definitely <laughs> right. I agree. I think that it was a horrible move. Um, and yeah, because the numbers didn't go up right away. Isn't it two weeks for it to show up? Yeah. Um, 14 yeah. days. 14 days. Yeah. So... Yeah, I mean, it looked like, yeah, oh, well, the, nothing happened over the stampede because the, the numbers didn't go up, but that's not actually true because, like we said, it takes 14 days, and then we saw a huge increase in, uh, in our ICU beds. Um, and, you know, I just feel so bad for our healthcare workers. You know, they've been working so hard. And, you know, for our, this government, the Alberta government, to be clear, to uh, take away their goal well, to cut back on their wages and... Mm. Um, you know, not take this pandemic seriously. Like, it, it's really heartbreaking to see. We 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 saw in the early day, or the end of August, beginning of September, the province sort of do a, a 360 pivot turn and start taking this a little bit more serious. They introduced more measures, but they also canceled surgery. Now, anyone who's listened to this show... Including <laughs> no. yours, Chris. I think that's where we're going with <laughs> yeah, it. Exactly. Knows that my surgery was canceled at the beginning of uh, September, and I've been pushed off, and uh, hopefully, hopefully, knock on wood, barring any Omicron or Megatron uh, variant, massive outbreak between now and the day that I have my surgery, I'm, uh, as of airing this, I am recovering. I'm sitting in my bed, probably dying, because I want to... Do something and my husband's probably not letting me mm -hmm. but I I, I want to take a moment and talk about the people outside of me who had their surgeries canceled mm -hmm. now 
this is this is where people yell at me and send negative emails and say negative comments. I, and I'll say it till the day I die. I don't blame Jason Kenny for my surgery being canceled. I don't blame. I don't blame Jason Kenny. I don't blame Tyler Shandro at the time. I don't blame Justin Trudeau. I don't blame Mayor Nenshi, who I do blame. And this is the big one, like Colby said. The people who didn't get vaccinated, mm -hmm. they're the cause of the reason. Because the numbers increased because the people who weren't vaccinated were filling up the hospitals, causing a shortage of beds for people who, like myself, who needed surgery. I, I don't know them off by heart. I don't know the names of everyone who didn't get vaccinated, but I can tell you this. Shame on you. And this is Chris Brown saying this is not Olga and... Uh, oh, I agree. Brown, but <laughs> give your Go head a fucking shake. You, you, you smoke cigarettes. You put alcohol in your body. You do much more worse things than a vaccination that gets put into your body. There was no microchip. I don't have 5G. Speak for yourself. Bill, <laughs> Bill, Bill Gates is not tracking my every movement. You know who's tracking your every movement? China with your goddamn Apple iPhones and your iPads and your smart watches uh -oh. and your Samsungs. For anyone who's in China listening to this right now, I've always wanted to see your country, but I'm probably not invited anymore, so... After you say that, probably not. As we're holding our Apple computers. <laughs> but, I would say it's Facebook that's tracking all you, of the data. And exactly. TikTok. Wait, like, where's your... Give your head a shake, that's all I can say, because you're the reason my surgery was cancelled, and I know the people who are going to come out and say, no, it wasn't it's the doctors who were lying. Well, fuck you. You're not a doctor. You never will be. The highest education you ever got was grade two, probably. <laughs> oh, wow. We're really going at it, aren't we? Here we go. <laughs> I, I, I have no time for it anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm willing to call it like it is. But yeah, well, it breaks my heart, though, because I do consider you to be a friend. I know Deborah considers yeah. you to be a friend, too. And it makes us sad. Like, we're, I was devastated to hear that everything got canceled for you, but yeah. at least now, I cannot talk. Um, at least by now, when this is uh, put out, you will have had the surgery, at least. Mm -hmm. God willing. Yeah. God willing. God willing, that is something I would never say, but Iron Man willing, Mighty Thor willing, Incredible Hulk willing, anyone willing, Pokemon willing, I will have, will have had my surgery on December 2nd, and yeah. I will be back soon. But we're not here to talk about me, we're here to talk about politics in the last 12 months. All so right. open for summer. Um, Jason Kenney's had a very, very terrible, not so good year. He has seen the ups and downs of COVID-19. I don't think he thought uh, going into provincial politics he would be dealing with a global pandemic. I don't think anyone going into politics in 2019's election thought they would be dealing with a global pandemic. But here we are. I want to speak about one cabinet minister in particular. Okay. Tyler Shandra. Well, ex... Well, let's talk, well... About, let's talk about him in the, pre the, the past tense All first. Right. Tyler Shandro was the Alberta Health Minister as of swearing in on August or April 30th, 2019, Stephen Harper's birthday, for anyone who wants to just fact check that quick. <laughs> I trust you. I don't want to. <laughs> it, it's true. That's literally why they swore in on that day. Yeah, that's um, April 30th, 2019, Tyler Shandro was sworn in as Minister of, Municipal, of, Minister of Health, and he was Minister of Health until... August, or actually September of this year, when he was switched out, shuffled out to Minister of Jobs and Immigration, and the new minister, Jason Copping, was put in. Uh, let's start with... Can the... I interrupt? I'm so sorry. Oh, go ahead. Um, Tyler Chandro, Labor and Immigration. Le what did I say? Talking about Jobs and Immigration. Jason Copping. No, Tyler Shandro oh. went to Labor okay. and Immigration because... What did I say? Jobs, Economy, Innovation, I thought. Okay. I don't know. Anyway, for those anyway, who want sorry. to rewind this for 30 seconds and can <laughs> prove that I was wrong or right, go ahead. Sorry. If not, me. Um, we'll start with the person who was in the halls of power, who was actually there in the halls of power, seeing cabinet shuffles as they happened. Um, Chandra getting 
the the, the old heave ho into a lesser but still important position. Deborah, mm-hmm. was this a good move on Kenny's part, or was it trying to save his hide at the end of the day? I think it's the latter. <laughs> Um, because frankly, he, he could have shuffled him out a long time ago. Cause I think I've mentioned a few times now that they have failed. Um, just a couple. Yeah. <laughs> a big time on this file, uh, with, you know, health and the pandemic and everything. And that, you know, we had Tyler Shandro actually yell and scream at a doctor in yeah. the driveway and yet he still wasn't shuffled out of a cabinet. So interesting um i think that you know what the one thing i have noticed with jason kenny is that he's quite loyal to his mlas and to his ministers um who are loyal to him who are loyal to him yeah <laughs> and right uh, <laughs> and so i think that's the reason I'm, I'm speaking candidly here is that i think that's the reason why he has lasted as long as he has um and uh i'm not sad to see him go i mean i think that he shouldn't even be a minister i think that he's he, still around he, uh, well, yeah, um, but I mean, I'm, he, he can't be on this file anymore. He's failed too many people in this province, uh, on so many levels. And I just <laughs> couldn't, I mean, I saw it coming from back in 2019 during the election. However, I didn't think it would be this bad. So, yeah. Uh, to piggyback onto that, Olga. Usually the party in power looks for somebody, you would hope, who has background in said ministry. So with the provincial, with the federal government, we may not be the best, but we had a graphic designer who was the minister of health. And now we have a lawyer who was the minister of health. We have a lawyer who's the minister of national defense. Um, We try, though... And I would hope that all parties try to put people in ministries that they would be suited for, like a nurse or a doctor in a position of ministry of health. Maybe not an educational professional, but a like a minister of health who represents and has worked in the medical field. When you look at the front bench of the. P- UCP, I was going to call them the PCs, but the UCPs, uh-huh. yeah. you don't see much of a willingness to have people raise their hand and say, hey, I have a medical background, put me in the Ministry of Health. Do you? No, and correct <laughs> me if I'm wrong, I don't think there is one person in the caucus who has a medical background. And from Oh, what... no, they do. Tanio, oh. he's a paramedic. There we go. Tanio. Yeah. But, uh, I mean, he was not placed in a ministry, so... It is what it is. But I will say with Jason Copping, because the current health minister, his background is in human resources. So I don't know how that relates to health care. I mean, mm-hmm. union busting with the nurses. Mm-hmm. That's where my mind goes. Mm-hmm. But anyway, what, well, what do Kenny, I know? Kenny the, likes to pick favorites. Because the reason I say that is because Rick McIver, Minister mm-hmm. of Municipal Affairs, former counselor. So he knows AUMA, Alberta Municipalities yeah. now. He knows... The ins and outs of municipalities. So he knows how to talk municipal languages. So, like when you look at Ron Orr, you don't, it doesn't scream Minister of Culture, but yet again, he's the Minister of Culture. That's their end status of women, so good for them. I, I, Your face I, says it all. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Embarrassing. Exactly. And under the previous government, the NDP, they, they seem to have uh, less parliamentary secretaries. So they, I think if they, if I'm not mistaken, they had two, one for health and one for education. Annie McKendrick and uh, Jessica Littlewood. Okay, maybe three then. I was gonna say Brandy Payne, but she might have been an associate. She was associate. Okay, so two: yeah. Jessica Littlewood and Annie McKendrick. Under this government, it seems like we like to pack the bench and give everyone who wants a title a title. Yeah. We, we now have. A minister of status, a minister of culture and status of women, an associate minister dedicated to status of women, a parliamentary secretary for status of women on the issues of seniors. Wow. Okay. When when like I, I, I'm expecting there to be a new announcement in about six months for the under parliamentary secretary to the minister of status of women for seniors for the northeast section of 18th Avenue one day like. 
Can I comment on that? That's what I was about to say. <laughs> um, <laughs> Status Women has the lowest budget out of all of the ministries, so I'm shocked that there's so many positions. They care. Oh, yeah. They clearly, really care. have seen so many policies that are geared just towards women that's actually helping women not. Um, yeah. No, that was my second thing is where where's the policies? Where What are they doing in terms of helping women in this province? I... Other than domestic violence, which they have touched on, um, I forget what the bill's called. Claire's Law? Claire's Law, yeah. Claire's Law, and then earlier this month, uh, Premier Kenny and Amarjeet Sohi, mayor of uh, Edmonton, did make an announcement about uh, about um, assault and uh, finding resources and putting resources into helping women who have been uh, victims of domestic abuse. Right. Okay. So, other than that, I have not seen anything else. Um, I will give them a thumbs up. The only thumbs up I'll ever give them is for, yeah, Claire's Law. I think that was a brilliant move um, to help women uh, warn them if there's, you know, a predator out there on uh, a dating app. Um, if they, or a perpetrator, I should say, um, before they get, get in that situation, it's preventative. And I, I think it's actually quite smart. Um, I'm but, just gonna I'm gonna interrupt you here for yeah. two seconds. First, you're calling it carbon tax. Then you're you're giving a thumbs up to UCP. No, what the hell? Did you convert here? over the last like three two and She's a half years? She's defective. I don't know. <laughs> no, never. Um, no. Uh, I'm just you know I will I'll give credit when credit's due, and I think that is the only thing that I think they've done right on in terms of helping women in this province is that. Because I am very passionate around helping victims of domestic violence. And yes, I don't see it as a partisan thing. And so if... It shouldn't be. It shouldn't be. I think that, you know, we need... To, it's something that needs to uh, be addressed in, in in Alberta, especially because we have some of the highest rates in the country. So, yeah, I think that they should continue uh, working on that. And, um, yeah. So, that I'm not saying that I like the UCP. I do not. I'm just putting that on the credit where credit's due. I think there's a lot of people yeah. who forget that. But sometimes the opposition can potentially have good ideas. It's a weird concept for some people, but just remember that sometimes people can have good ideas that don't agree with you fully. So. Journalism is in crisis, and our mission here at the Cross Border Interview Podcast is to tell the story that isn't being told. It is vital that independent journalism survives with the rise of fake news. Every penny that is contributed to the Cross Border Interview Podcast goes to help continue our work to tell people's stories. All of our content is produced and edited by our team. The Cross Border Interview Podcast provides entirely free content, and we will never hide stories behind paywalls. By supporting a new model of journalism, our listeners, like you, are supporting real, independent journalism. Consider making a monthly donation via our Patreon account, or make a one-time donation by Interact eTransfer. Now, let's get back to the show. Um, as, uh, let's stick to the realm of political politics because Old Man Red from up north in Fort McMurray decided our to... Our man, re- Brian Jean. Our man, Brian Jean. <laughs> Old Red? I never heard that. <laughs> His hair. His yeah, hair. No, look at him. Good. I like really? It. Oh, okay, yeah. maybe it was just a slave lake thing. Okay. <laughs> It was the former MP for Slave Lake. That's why. That's the only reason yeah. I know that. Okay. Um, so Brian Jean, former MLA for Athabasca or Fort McMurray at the Fort McMurray Cold Lake or um, Fort McMurray. I it was Fort McMurray. Fort McMurray Conklin. Wood Buffalo. No, Wood, Conklin. no Wood Buffalo. You're right. Tanny No, yeah, that's Tanny Wood Buffalo. No, so, well, anyway, he anyway. was the former MLA for Wood uh, Fort McMurray. Yeah. He was the former. Uh, MP for Fort McMurray Athabasca way back when. Uh, and now, former official opposition leader in 2015 to 2017 under the Wild Rose Party when uh, the NDP were in power. He retired when the parties merged in 2018. He did not run for re election in 2019. But he has reared his head and he is making his no, uh, making noise to get back into the legislature. He's like Groundhog Day. You know, there's an election <laughs> coming up when Brian Jean pops his head out and then 
You might see a shadow for six months and you might go back down. Who knows? <laughs> so or Larry Heather here in Calgary. Yeah. There you go. Or Kevin Johnson. Ah, oh, there you <laughs> there go. We, go. <laughs> we, we all have those groundhog days. If there's an election to be had and he potentially could win, you pop up your head. CamCon. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, I let's let's dissect Brian Jean for a second. Because this is a big thing that has happened. And this yeah. has happened relatively late in uh, 2021. Brian Jean has been making waves throughout this pandemic about uh, the handling of COVID-19 and Jason Kenney's leadership. But it wasn't until August and September where things really started to get the ground running when Leela Goodridge, the former MP, for, former MLA mm-hmm. for Fort McMurray. Black LaBiche. Black LaBiche, thank you, Olga. It was a great thing about fact checkers. When you're doing this by yourself, you really can't <laughs> fact check. But. So it was Fort McMurray Conklin, but then it became Fort McMurray Black LaBiche as of 2019. Okay, so Fort McMurray Black LaBiche, uh, Leela Goodridge, who literally took over for Brian Jean, uh, decided that she was going to resign and run federally because uh, David Yurdega had announced that he was stepping down. He wasn't going to run under Aaron O'Toole. He went on to endorse the PPP, PPC candidate in Fort McMurray, Athabasca. But Brian Jean has said that he is going to make a return to the legislature because he thinks Jason Kenney is going to lead the party to defeat. If they let him run. If they let him run. Olga, were you shocked at Brian Jean's sudden reappearance in the political realm in 2021? Because I was. No. Really? No. It... I mean, my family and I, we would talk about it. would be like, you know, I wonder what Brian Jean is up to. I wonder what he's thinking. And I, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. He was in Australia for the last while here, correct? I don't know. Um, I'm going to say I don't know because that's the first I've ever heard of that. Yeah. I swear I saw something on Twitter. I could be wrong, though, so don't quote me on that. But, like, oh, okay. um, I, I heard rumors of him... Wanting to get involved, I think, just from the Twitterverse, t- everything, you know, you can take it with a grain of salt. Um, well, wasn't there a Twitterverse that, like, country music star George Canyon was going to run for the president of the UCP? Oh, yeah. To kick out Jason Kenney <laughs> yeah. at the AGM next year? Like, yeah, I don't know what happened to that. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> but I, I agree, like, Twitter can be a fun place to learn things, but sometimes you have to go, hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, I, I don't know. I mean... I think the guy cares about politics. I genuinely do. I don't know. Will he pass the betting process for the UCP? It's a good question, I think. Yeah, I think that Brian Jean considers himself more of a moderate than... (laughs) This is what I've heard, okay? (laughs) I know I laugh too, to be honest, but um, this is what I've heard. And so, you know, Jason Kenney is far right. Um, and yeah, I think that, you know, at one point he was labeled the most popular leader in Alberta. Uh, I do think that, you know, it's a smart move on his end to be completely honest with you. I mean, he already has the experience, um, of running a party. I think that, yeah, this would be the best time to swoop in and try and take over. Before, we'll talk about 2022 here in a few minutes, but I still want to stick to the Brian Jean thing. Um, 2018 to 2021 is a long time in politics. Things have changed. Uh, The world has changed. Mm COVID-19 has changed. Uh, COVID-19 has changed the world. Is Brian Jean the, and I hate to use this phrase, but is he the old man on the block? Does he has does he have what it takes to win the nomination if they allow him to? Uh, I'm gonna say yes. I will say yes. Also, he has been around for quite some time. I mean, so has Kenny. Yeah, they both have. Kenny's not well liked within his own party. Clearly not. And well, so I if think he keeps on giving everyone parliamentary secretaries jobs, <laughs> then like... well, I'm not talking about just the the cabinet and the caucus. I'm talking about. In, terms of the UCP. Um, well, I wa- well, that's a weird that's a weird statement to say because I watched that policy convention mm-hmm. last weekend or few in November, November 19th to be exact, November 19th to 21st. I watched his speech. People were clapping, people were happy, people were excited that he was talking, he was saying the good points. Alberta's back, Alberta's great, Alberta's on the roll. Like are, that are, we a living, lot. are we living in a Twitter bubble? 
Yeah. Maybe it's a possibility. I just, I've been behind the scenes in politics. I've been to these AGMs and conventions and I see what goes on. And I mean, (laughs) I'm just saying that, yes, when they have their speech and there's lots of people in the room and people are cheering, literally, like, that's the biggest, the most entertaining part of the whole thing. People genuinely just leave after that. Um, because then you go what, no one wants to debate policy. resolution 12 18, yeah. 19 and 21 those are the do- diehards <laughs> that stay for that one but uh, yeah I mean that's pretty typical to see that uh, big you know, applause for their leader but I don't think that uh, I mean this is just me speculating I don't know for sure but I don't think that he's very popular within his, the party right now looking back at January 2021 did you did you think that Jason Kenney would be potentially losing his leadership by this time in January? Like, looking back, were you thinking Jason Kenney's going to lose his party? Because I did not have Brian Jean on my bingo card for 2021. I will be blunt about that. Mm-hmm. I did not expect him to ever make his uh, appearance again until Jason Kenney left. Because I think Jason Kenney and him, like, they have a love-hate relationship. They love to despise each other, and they want, like to take each other down as much as possible. Did you have him on, like, to make an appearance in 2021 again? Do you want to call me? Oh, you go ahead. Um, To be honest, I called this since, you know, the day after the election. I knew that this party would go down and go down fast because there's way too many egos in that party, in that legislature, and Jason Kenney... Uh, frankly, he yes, he was the MP for a long time, but he never spent time in Calgary. He was always in Ontario. He he doesn't know a lot about Calgary. He likes to think that he's a Calgarian cowboy driving his blue truck. It's an act. Um, I'm just speaking candidly. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I don't. I saw that uh, there would be a lot of internal conflict, which is now happening. Um, I did not see him being an effective leader, and I did honestly predict that this would happen. I didn't think it would happen this quick. Mm. I didn't either. I thought it was going to be at least one term because yeah, Brian, like Jason Kenney, has the ability, and I know we shouldn't be talking about Jason Kenney because I feel like if it's like a Bloody Mary in the mirror when you turn off all the lights, you say the name <laughs> it's three gonna times, show up. it's going to show up That's at your terrifying. door. <laughs> but I, I never count Jason Kenney out. Jason Kenney is cunning, right? This is true. He knows how to play the political game. And when the going gets tough, the tough, like, he knows how to get down and dirty. He got down and dirty during the last leadership election mm-hmm. between him, Brian Jean, and Doug Schweitzer, mm-hmm. which I'll, I will give you a, I will give you some ex, a semi-exclusive news here a few minutes from now. Oh. But... Um, Jason Kenney should not be counted out. I I think he's going to survive the leadership race. I think Brian Jean's going to be back in. I think the UCP are going to be are going to lose some some seats, but they won't lose government. But if there's a leadership review and if it does actually happen, I will eat crow. But there will be three candidates on that ballot. Yes. Not just Jason Kenney, not Brian Jean. Can I take a guess? Go ahead. Uh, Danielle Smith? Nope. Uh, that was my guess. Doug Schweitzer. Oh, I see that. First, yeah, that doesn't su- surprise me. Surprise. Surprise me. Doug all. Schweitzer didn't have a name in the 2017 UCP election. Mm. He was this unknown person who came out of nowhere. Now he's kept his, his hair clean. He's done good at, in uh, jobs, economic, uh, economy, and innovation. He's done, he did good as Attorney General. He's kept his nose clean. I wouldn't be surprised to see him on the ballot as well, if there was a leadership race. I'm not saying there would be, but if Jason if Jason Kenny loses the leadership review, it's going to be Brian Jean, Daniel Smith, and Doug Schweitzer. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's my bold prediction of 2022 there. We'll see. Yeah. Uh, the last, the second last area because we're closing in on the hour mark here, and I have two last areas oh, I want wow. to talk about. It is Goodness. one is um, municipal elections. Fun times. Calgary municipal elections. Oh, we oh we got a close monitor because we <laughs> know what we're talking. 
I'm just not even using my computer, to be oh. honest. Um, Calgarians went to the polls on October 20th, and we elected our first female mayor of our great city. Uh, we, For those who watched our election night special, we literally had the recap of the, these three, our, our two lovely guests and myself, but I'm going to just say this. We are a month in from election day. Well, a month and a half as of airing this, but a month in from election day and from when everyone got sworn in. Any surprises about this election, about this council? Any shocks? Any, okay, why are they doing this? Or is it pretty much same old, same old in municipal politics? Olga? Um, I think there's the Sean Chu situation. Mm -hmm. There's, there's that. There was a protest. I did attend it. I forget the date. I want to say it was pretty quick after, after the yeah. election, and I did December, go. December or October 23rd. Yes, I believe something like that. Um, and then they're actually, as of um, this recording being released, there will be another one on December 4th, this Saturday, which I, I hope I'm, I can attend it, Yeah. depending on work. But, um, so Yeah. Thoughts? You bring up a good point. I'm gonna I'm gonna stick with you here for a second. Oh, okay. sure. Yes, let's do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Res the the resigned Sean Chu movement. Mm -hmm. It all comes down to him. You can't force him out. Mm -hmm. You can't kick him out. You can give him less work. But I had this guest on the show who literally said this, and I actually agreed with him. When you do something wrong at work, you don't get less work and get paid the same as your fellow employees, do you? Like, you, you took the guy's uh, boards and commissions away from him. He gets paid the exact same as every other counselor, but now he literally has less work to do. Mm. Like, to me, if you do something wrong, A, he should fucking resign. Pardon my French. I, I will say that to the day I die as someone who's gone through what the woman who alleged, has alleged that he has done. Because remember, he has not been found guilty in a court of law. So he has been found in contempt by the police board, but not in a court of law. And we are innocent until proven guilty. I hate to say that, but that is our legal system. This, John Chu has the right to be there as much as everyone else does, right? So how, how can we affect change in a world where we have given the power to people who have assaulted people and there's nothing we can do about it until four years from now. It's not yeah. like this happened yesterday. It happened. But there is something we could do about it because what's that? The provincial government yes. can, um, uh, there's a fire. recall legislation. No, recall, recall legislation. It's under the municipal government act. Okay. And there is a possibility, um, for them to, um, so, okay, no, no, okay. Now, now, we've, now we've gotten to the meat and bones of the show. Yeah. Okay, I agree. If the recall legislation was passed tomorrow, let's do it. But then you have to look into the recall legislation as it's written. Surprise, surprise. Who has? This guy has. 40% of the people who voted for him in the ward that voted for him. Not the city, but the ward. So 40% of the 40% of the population in Ward 4 would have to sign that recall legislation. We, we just saw an election with 50% turnout mm -hmm. across the board, with 20% turnout in Northeast Calgary. What gives you sort of hope that we can find 40% of Ward 4 residents who would, who would sign that uh, recall legislation? Can I take that real quick here? I think with we're um, going deep, guys. I apologize, but I I, I, I won't, I won't I'm want just, to ask this. Question, I'm amazed so. with the timing of like going. It's almost been an hour, and I'm just I know. Well, anyway, away. um, I think I, I think right now they're going to be really focusing on the protests. You know, they're going to be. I don't think this is going to end. I think there will be more even after this one on the fourth. Um, it's more or less just like keeping the fire alive, like really just making sure people are still aware of what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, I did read somewhere that he tried to reach out to the victim, which... What? Yeah, that's not right. Okay. Okay, now... now oh. Anyway, I'm sorry. Getting, I'm getting into a really weird spot right now, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep on going if you don't mind. Deborah, you literally wrote a bill as an independent MLA, 
about this issue, about being able to get locked, uh, get, uh, getting out of uh, uh, leases mm-hmm. if you're locked in. Mm-hmm. My question to you is, you probably spoke to many people of uh, assault, of domestic abuse. Mm-hmm. One thing I've been told, and this, I, and this is where I truly want to know. One thing I've been told is, repeating the name of your attacker is not the smart thing to do, particularly in regards to the victim, right? If you keep because it brings up emotional mm-hmm. memories, it brings up the memories of the attack over and over. Yeah, of course. I mean, that that could definitely be triggering for, like, your healing process if you're trying to, you know, if you're trying to get away from the perpetrator and trying to, you know, go back to normal. I mean, that's probably years of trauma they had to go through. And to have that name brought up over and over again probably, yeah, can be very triggering for them. Are we, the media, social media, doing a disservice to the victim by saying his name over and over again? Tough question. It is yeah, a I know tough it's a tough question, question but I yeah. need to ask it because I don't know the answer to that. Because mm. I can tell you from the time when I was assaulted as a 13 year old boy, when I saw my attacker in the news on the street, it triggered me every single time. Yet again, that was 25 years ago, and now I'm now, and I'm oh, I can openly talk about it, but. There are still days when if I see someone with that same last name or that same first name, it does trigger me. Mm-hmm. So, <laughs> are we doing a disservice? I, 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 I hate to put it so bluntly, but I feel like we are. Am I wrong here? I think the one positive that's coming out of this, though, is it's starting the conversation and it's making sexual harassment and abuse uh, like talked about and how you know it, there's it's it's like domestic violence in the sense where it's so stigmatized and no one wants to talk about it and it's hidden behind the scenes and I think this is a good way for more people to feel empowered enough to you know if they're brave enough or if they're ready to talk about it then they can bring forward their story and get help and and start the healing process um, I do agree with you Chris that yeah definitely would be triggering and and it would be really hard to see your victim in the news over and over and hear their name um but you know hopefully we can get some sort of you know proper resolution out of this i don't know if he will resign i mean at the end of the day it is his decision but like i said there is legislation in place with the provincial government that could potentially uh you know fire him um i mean we had the education minister Andrea LaGrange. Adriana LaGrange. Adri- I never say her name right, correct? Sorry, but um, she was threatening the CBE, right? To, oh, yeah. That they would lose their jobs. So they definitely have the power. But, you know, Jason Kenney did say that he uh, is disgusted by his actions. But yet, what's he going to do about it? So, uh, yeah, I think that's where we're at. It's like, let's actually do something about it. I agree with you wholeheartedly on that one. Yeah. My last question on the uh, council and the Sean Chu, uh, in, not incident, but the Sean Chu uh, allegations and assault. Y- you mentioned it briefly there for a second there, Olga. Yes. By having protests, you hope people will keep it in their front of their mind. Yeah. People will remember. I'm going to go back to our first 15 minutes on the show. Perfect. Let's do it. And I'm going to say this. 215 kids were found buried at a residential school in unmarked graves. How many today? Do we know? No. People are still reporting it. But do people, and I, have, and I say this not uh, sarcastically, but have we become desensitized to the fact that we are finding children and have we become desensitized to the fact that there's protest after protest that we'll become desensitized to the fact that we have a counselor who is on council and has been accused of assaulting. And he's admitted that he did something wrong, but I shouldn't say but 
he's 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 he said that he did something wrong. He knows what happened, and he like you said, he tried to reach out to the victim. Are we just going to make this more desensitized to ourselves and just blow it off and say, huh, ah, okay, four years from now we'll vote him out, but until then, we maybe have to, we have to work with him. You never know. And I and I hate to say that, and I I'm not trying to be glib about it. I just. I, I don't want this issue to be desensitized like everything else in our world. And yeah. with social media, we have become desensitized to a lot of things. And it seems after the 15-minute news cycle, we have forgotten and we move on to the next uh, campaign that we need to win or fight. Yeah, I think short memories is common everywhere. Um, and it's really disheartening. I mean, let's, re- let's really talk about it, though. DJ Kelly was only, what, it was 52 votes? 100, 100 votes at the end of it. 100 votes at the end of it, okay. Still, that's such a small margin that people might just not even think about it because I think it's not even necessarily a problem with desensitization. It's apathy. People just don't care because there's so much dread and despair in the world, especially with COVID, especially in the time that we're in. Mm-hmm. Everyone is feeling it. Yeah. And they're just kind of like, you know, this is just another thing to ignore, blah, 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 blah. But people like us, I don't think we can because we're so plugged into that. Yeah. But people just kind of, they ignore it if it isn't, like, making them feel better. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. That's kind of my take on it. I, I completely agree with you. Deborah, any last words before we move on to the last subject? Because, like I said, we're trying to keep you guys going. and But we have one last subject we want to talk about. And it's just like a five-minute clip. I could go on forever. Can we just keep going? <laughs> Whatever, however long you want to. I might go make a sandwich, go to the laundry room if you guys want to keep on talking. But I love being on your show. It's great. Mm-hmm. It's a good time. It's a good time. Good time. But, um, yeah, I think, at, you know, my last words on this matter is, you know, he should feel um, ashamed of himself. Uh, he should resign. Um, yeah, I think it's... You know, I can talk about what happened to me when I was elected and all this stuff came out. Frankly, I didn't do anything illegal. I didn't harm anybody. Um, That's why I kept going. Frankly, I could have resigned. That would be the easy route for me. But, you know, I wanted to make a big change in in regards to women here in the province, um, tackling issues like violence against women. Sean Chu, frankly, has nothing to offer of our city. What has he done? I can't think of one thing. Um, And then there's this on top of everything else. He's not an effective counselor. He's a predator. He needs to go. And we will see what 2022 has in store for Sean Chu, but we we will see what's in store for a lot of politicians in 2022. Mm -hmm. Um, the last area I want to talk about is the one of the biggest political news stories here in Canada in the last 12 months, and that is the election. In August, we went to the poll. August 16th, we decided, uh, Justin Trudeau decided to pull the court and s- send the entire country into a pandemic election at the start of the fourth wave. Um, we had the Afghanistan uh, interpreters issue going on because Joe Biden literally pulled out the uh, yeah. military the day that we called an election. We had the wildfires raging in BC. We had uh, First Nations uh, kids being found in many different uh, residential schools across in unmarked graves. This election was a gamble and while he didn't outright said it, I think everyone in their world thought to themselves that Justin Trudeau was aiming for a majority government. No one likes a minority government. They always want a majority government. Fast forward a month, and all we got was the exact same makeup of the House of Commons. Mm-hmm. Just a few changes. Just a few changes. Minor. And the, and the few changes I want to talk about just quickly are the Three big changes here in the province of Alberta. Two Liberal MPs, Randy Bossineau returning to the House of Commons uh, in Edmonton Centre. Uh, George Chahal, Liberal MP for Calgary Skyview, uh, going off to uh, Ottawa, defeating Jake Sahota. And we'll talk about him in a few seconds. And uh, Blake, I forget, his, I don't know how to pronounce your last name, so I'm not going to try to butcher it. But Blake from Edmonton, Edmonton Griesbach. Uh, NDP MP beating Carrie Viot. 
you have four opposition MPs in a minority government. This is for four different MPs from the Conservative Party because the Conservatives are very known to be very uh, stronghold in Alberta. The first question I have to ask is, we now have two NDP, two Liberal, a Liberal mayor in Edmonton, Amarjeet Sohi. Mm -hmm. We have Jody Gondek in Calgary, the mayor. We have more mayor women, women who are mayor in the city of the province of Alberta since the last municipal election. Are we more of a progressive province than people might think? I don't know, Why to not? be honest. Why not? Because that sucks for an answer for the <laughs> I know, wow. I know, but I think... Is it just a fluke, or is the right so no, pissed off think, right now that they don't know where to go? I think it's a big protest, definitely, in that sense. I think Blake uh, Desjardins, I believe it's the pronunciation, I could be wrong, he did put an amazing campaign, and I was following it for quite some time. Yeah. Um, it was very grassroots-based, which I'm just commendable, incredible. Um, I think with, from, I don't know much about Edmonton, but with Calgary Skyview, um, George Chahal did have the name recognition. He was a city councillor from Ward 5, correct? He was. Exactly. So I think that did help him in that aspect. Um, I don't know that we're more progressive, but I do think that maybe people are more willing to learn and accept it, and I think we can get there one day. Yeah, my take on it is I will say that the Liberals did a good job in terms of uh, tackling COVID-19 and um, in terms of like the CRB and uh, CERB mm -hmm. funding and um, you know they actually took it seriously and I think that's why they did pick up a couple seats because um, I think you know Calgarians like yeah I can't really speak for Edmonton but they tend to focus on certain issues and if those issues align with a certain party they will vote that way or they will vote strategically in a sense where they don't like the leader of one party so they'll vote the other way it's not that they are or in they'll favor. just stay home yeah that too. exactly they're not in favor of one part or the other they're just like okay this aligns with what i want so this is how i'm voting i don't think it's like a left or a right thing here it's more like yeah like i said it's what how it aligns with their life and how it would benefit them and their communities yeah i uh... I, I, I would not be a good person without talking about the elephant in the room, and that is George DeHaul's uh, legal problems that he's been dealing with over the last few weeks. Um, my husband and I jokingly always say that since we've installed security cameras at our front door, we're going to put a big giant sign that says, Caution, George DeHaul, these premises are under security <laughs> presence. Oh, God. Uh, but we decided not to. But if we might do that, we might sell them as a fundraiser to raise money for the show for those conservatives who hey. really hate the liberals. Um, George DeHaul was destined to be a cabinet minister. His, his chances got turfed when he was found guilt or found in possession of Jag Sahotas, the conservative MPs at the time. Uh, campaign literature as of a doorbell cam. Mm -hmm. Do you think that George Shaw has a chance of being becoming cabinet minister, or is his his days of ever be becoming the honorable George Shaw dashed? Olga, I don't. Uh, again, I don't know because as as we've mentioned, people have short memories. Yep. I think it's very dependent on what comes out with these. Investigations. Investigations. Put yeah. it that way. I agree. If, uh, it, if it works out to his benefit, I think he could. Not right away, though. Maybe in a year or two, yeah, I is my guess. That. Yeah. Unless Justin Trudeau decides to pull another election. <laughs> That's true. Please, no. And then George Shahal will do his piece. <laughs> yeah. I think there's a lot yeah, of people who. Yeah. Um, but I want, I want to say this just to both Olga and Deborah. I want to thank you. This year, ten minute, an hour and ten minutes into this, wow. and we are gonna wrap up here because uh, yeah. people have Christmas shopping to do and a lot of other things to prepare for. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, Olga, Deborah, thank you for everything you've done for the show over the last few months. Um, 
my husband told me I had to do this down here with, out of earshot of him, and he refuses to watch this episode. So, um, over oh, what's rude? Um, <laughs> you'll, you'll, better watch. Okay, you'll, sorry. Ex- you'll, you'll understand. Okay. Uh, I don't know what's going to happen on my certain journey. I don't know if I'm going to still be here or be gone. Uh, over the last 12 months, over the last few years, whatever, over the last uh, few months with you, Olga, have uh, have been a great moment in my life that I hope to never forget. But if I do, please note that you have meant more to me than you will ever know. You have helped me in more ways than I will ever be able to give back. You both have made dark days good. You've made bad moments hilarious. You have been great guests of the show. You've been great friends of the family. And I have, uh, I do con- truly consider you my friends. Um, I hope to have you back on in the new year. Uh, I can't promise anything, but know that wherever Thursday goes and however Thursday takes place, you both both are great uh, for everyone here at the cross border interview podcast uh, this is our very last episode of uh, 2021 we will be back for two full weeks of shows before we figure out if chris is actually coming back to us or not yes he is he will be <laughs> but we will make sure of it yes uh we will be back january 2nd for a new episode for to fully recap 2021 with uh past guests but also, we will be back on January 10th for, actually, January, I, I don't know the date, but the second week, of, third week of January, we'll be back with a full week of episodes. Um, please tune in. It will be great. For everyone here at the Cross Border Inter- Interview Podcast, have yourself a great Friday, great Saturday, Sunday, Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, and please remember, don't drink and drive, and if you no. do, there's a special place in hell for you. Keep talking, guys. Yeah.